So apparently there are millions and billions of stars out there in the universe. Then there are millions and billions of galaxies. So how on earth will we be able to classify all of these stars out there in these seven letters? O, B, A, F, G, K, M. I think when it comes to stellar classification, things can be pretty complicated. If a person is not familiar with the terms like the giants, dwarfs, type A, type B, but no freaking type C, and then when there are two stars with their magnitude difference of two, it becomes suddenly 6.3 in their brightness. We need to get this all in order. So how do we classify all of these stars? There are just so many of them out there. We can do all of this in the most obvious ways possible, as you might say, sorting them in order of their temperatures, brightness, shape, size, and everything you might think of. But before going into that, I think we should first clarify these astronomical terms. So the first thing is the brightness. And I think it is also the first thing anyone looks in a star. So how do we classify the stars according to their brightness and what scale do we use? So naturally, the brighter a star is in the night sky, the more important it becomes to the humans on Earth. For example, Sirius is the brightest star in the night sky and to the various cultures across the world, Sirius has been looked on as an important part. So every star has its own brightness. And to measure this brightness, we use the term the apparent magnitude. And this is related to the Earth. And this scale is also actually a non-linear scale, which is similar to the decibels of sound. So what this means is that if there's a difference of two in the magnitude, the difference in the brightness wouldn't necessarily be two. It would be something different. Since it is a non-linear scale, in this case, it is actually 6.3 times. And how did that happen? Well, it's because the scale is basically designed the way that the difference in magnitude of 5 would result in the brightness difference of 100, which gives us the exponential of 100 as 1 by 5, and it results in this number, which is actually 2.5119. So using this, we can see that if there's a difference in magnitude of 1, then the difference in brightness would be actually 2.5 and then uh, increasing its power to the 2, the difference would be actually 6.3. But here's the catch. The more negative the apparent magnitude is, the brighter would be the star. So looking at these numbers, you can see the sun is actually the brightest out of the all. But looking at these numbers, is sun the brightest object in a universe? <laughs> no. Well, we are measuring all of this related to Earth, which means that if a star is closer to us, it would be definitely more bright. But it isn't necessarily the brighter or the fainter one in the general scale of the universe. We can't say something is bigger just because it's closer to us. We need to put both of these objects on the same perspective or at the same distance to make a valid comparison, which is why in this case of brightness, we need one additional scale to measure things more accurately. And this brings us to the absolute magnitude. It's actually the apparent magnitude of a star if it would be placed at a distance of 10 parsec. What we do here is actually just take a star, put it at the distance of 10 parsec and just measure its apparent magnitude, which would gives us a similar scale if all of these stars would be at the same distance, how bright would they really look like? This is a place where we can make a good comparison. One parsec is actually a unit of astronomical distance, which is actually equal to 3.26 light years. And this brings us to the luminosity, which is actually the energy radiated by the star per unit time. Now, uh, dividing this by the area also gives us the radiant flux. And it is also a great measure of the star's intrinsic brightness. So finally, the temperature of a star is actually its surface temperature and it can be calculated by looking at their absorption spectra. Different stars show different lines in the absorption spectrum and by looking at them and studying them carefully gives us the idea about the star's internal composition and their temperatures. So coming back to the initial letters which we introduced, which were O, B, A, F, G, K, M, were actually the letters which we used to classify the stars on their temperatures. The O here is actually the hottest category of star and M is the coolest one. But there's an acronym if you want to learn this, which is O, B, a fine girl, kiss me. Or a guy if you prefer. But in the recent years, we also got some of the new letters, which are L, T and Phi. Now I know what you might be thinking, that why don't we use the alphabetical order, the A, B and C, D. 
Well, this is because when this was first being developed in the 1880s, Wilhelmina Fleming devised a system to classify stars based on the strength of hydrogen absorption lines. Spectra with the strongest line were classified as the A stars and the next the strongest as B. So down to the alphabetical order of O. Then later in the 1880s, Annie Jump Cannon revised this classification system, focusing on just a few letters from the origin system, which resulted in this pattern O, B, A, F, G, K, M. For example, our sun is actually of the G type, Sirius and Vega are of type A, Betelgeuse and Taurus are of type M. And I have a video for all of them, so just check them out. Now, not only this, their temperatures also gives us a good idea of their color, which is that the O stars are actually on the bluer side of the spectrum and the M stars are actually on the red side. A is somewhat white and G is the yellow. So all of these classes are further subgrouped into the 10 categories, which are actually enabled from the number 0 to 9. Uh, so they are somewhat like B, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to 9. And then you are going to have O which would again then start from 1. Like you would have B start from 0 all the way up to 9 and then the O category will start again with 0 and all the way to 9. Which means that the category B9 and O0 would have very slight difference in temperature. However, interestingly we can also classify these stars relative to their luminosity. For example, you might think that a brighter a star is, the hotter it should be. But this is not necessarily the case because the brighter ones here are actually the giant stars which are the giants and the super giants and they are on the cooler side. So when it comes to the luminosity classification we also again use the roman letters. In this case we start again from the 1 and all the way to 5. So this is the decreasing order of luminosity where 1 is at the top and these are the super giant stars and then there at the file number 5 are the main sequence stars. But here again our supergiants are also classified into two categories which are the 1A and the 1B. For example for the star Vega it has a category of A05 and it is actually a blue tinged main sequence star. So all this classification is really helpful because just by understanding and looking at the look of the stellar classification we can see that what kind of star it is you know for example what kind of star would it be with the classification M1, 1, AB? Well, M is for the giant stars and 1, AB is somewhere for the supergiant. So as you can see, M is also for the red stars. And in this case, you can see this is a famous star that you already know, <laughs> the Betelgeuse. So yeah, still don't know when it's going to explode. So similarly, where should be a G2, 5B? Well, G is for the yellow stars and the 5 here is for the main sequence star. It is its luminosity class. Now, can you guess which is this one? Well, <laughs> it's our favorite star, the sun. Just one more. Where should the B81A be lie? Mm, well, <laughs> you, you guessed it, right? This one is also a giant star as the 1AB signifies. but B8 is actually for the blue stars, so it is actually a blue supergiant star. And it's the Rigel, the Orion's brightest star. So there you go, now you understand how we have managed to put all of these stars, millions and billions of them out there, in these simple categories. And a lot of this credit goes to this lady, Annie Jump Cannon. And she had a major contribution in the stellar classification. She alone manually classified 350,000 stars and she was also the first woman to receive an honorary degree from the Oxford University. Those are a lot of achievements. So that is it for this one. I hope you guys liked it. Go ahead and check more of the stars out and happy stargate. I'll see you guys in the next one. Bye.